or we're starting part five. Any questions while I do my scrolling? All right, we will start. Let me open up the chat box. So part five of anabolic cellular signaling is mostly mTOR, but anabolic signaling in general. Uh, last time, last lecture, we finished up our four prong promoter recipe of mTOR, where it was immune system and chemicals, you know, prostaglandins and interleukins, interferon gamma, and, and the, these immune system, not quite hormonal, yeah, maybe you count prostaglandins as hormones. Like, you know, so the, it's, it's that gray space of what you count these chemical messengers, you know, what, what, what are cytokines compared to what, you know, a steroid hormone or, or, you know, like arachidonic acid derived things, eicosanoids, you know, what these things, How, where do you count those as, as, you know, activators of mTOR. So that's that first one is that, you know, the immune system, the chemicals, and then mechanical tension. So this is the loads placed upon the tissue. You're doing this in a weight room. You're doing it, maybe not at a weight room because it's quarantine, but you're, you're doing it on a pull-up bar with dumbbells. You're doing it by walking. You're doing it by the loads on your tissues when you sit down your your tissues your cells and and the communities of cells your tissues experience loads and and they're going to relay those messages through mechanotransduction so that's the second one the third one is the endocrine system and some of that's paracrine some of it's autocrine you know let's get into mechano growth factor stuff like that igf at the local level and but you know there's testosterone there's estrogen there's insulin there's igf there's growth hormone which most of its effects are going through igf but and then there's nutrition and we talked about we know all about carbs all about sugar and its effect on the endocrine system and pi3k signaling but we really went through amino acids we went through why are you eating protein and historically you know we we have nutritionists saying things like you know dietitians and nutritionists saying things like you know you only need and then they give you some really tiny number you only need 75 grams of of protein it's usually it's it's in relationship to you know per you know kilogram of body weight or something and they give you this really small number uh to support our biological processes and repairing and remodeling our our muscle and and you need this tiny figure and then on the opposite end of that we see competitive bodybuilding and people are eating, you know, 300 grams of protein more, maybe people eating tons of protein. And then we have the nutritionist saying, oh, stop, you're eating four times as much as you need. And the bodybuilders, well, I'm just, I, I'm, I would eat more if I had an appetite to do so. And, and where does the truth fall? You know, is, is it consistent with the dietitians and the, and the nutritionist or, or is it consistent with the bodybuilders? Well, when you see a bodybuilder do let's just talk experiential. Let's, let's ignore physiology for a second. Uh, when you see a bodybuilder follow the nutritionist's advice, and well, I was eating, you know, 101 grams of protein, whatever calculation they do that, that fits their body mass, 101 grams of protein for my whole cut phase and my bulk phase. And, and I came in and I came in last place. <laughs> it's like every time, if you try to follow the nutritionist's advice, you're coming in last place. That's like following the, uh, cyclists advice you're trying to do the tour de france and you are you're not doing any drugs you're like man i'm just i'm not even in the race i mean it's not like i'm the caboose i'm just there the train and i'm on foot is what it, you know, i'm not even on the train anymore and and so sometimes what seems to be scientific advice, what, what is a practitioner's advice, you know, it's an MD's advice, it's a, it's a dietitian's uh, advice, it's a whatever, is not consistent with practice. And then 
you start to see how the research unfolds. And it's interesting with protein at first, where people are saying, well, it's just protein in general. And like, well, no, maybe it's essential amino acids. We have non-essential amino acids. We have essential amino acids. Let's do a comparison. Oh, it turns out the essential amino acids are, are, are more important to be getting at the end of a workout or at the beginning of a workout or, or throughout the day. And it's like, well, there's different kinds of essential amino acids. You know, there's branch chains over here. Well, let's see if it's just the branch chains. Well, it turns out the branch chains are of particular importance compared to some of the other ones. And well, among the branch chains, there's leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And it turns out leucine is more important. Now, there, there's a bunch of amino acids that are that are more important. But the history of study, it, 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 it sort of gets more and more the understanding continues to evolve, continues to, to progress. And it's not about the number of grams of protein that you're eating necessarily. The, the nutritionist is probably right. And like, how many grams of protein do you need to, to you know, patch up your damaged tissue? You're sore, you've you know, banged up some membranes and, and and okay, you need to patch up some tissue. How much total protein do you need? Well, you know, not that much. I mean, I think the nutritionists are probably right. But what we're talking about is something a little more advanced than that. What we're talking about is something that's a little bit more chemically sophisticated, and that is metabolism. We're talking about initiation of hypertrophy and what starts hypertrophy, what initiates anabolism. It's not just, do we have the resources? You really only need this much. Yeah, who cares how much you need? What I care about is managing the anabolic leanings of my body. And, and that's where, when you start to understand nutrition and chemistry a little bit more, biochem a little bit more, you realize these high protein values do serve a purpose. And and maybe everyone is telling the truth, but there are facets of truth. And if you know all of them, you start to understand what Ronnie Coleman has been doing all this time and Jay Cutler and whatever other bodybuilders you know, are, are eating a ton of protein. Of, of We are trying to align our mTOR complex. We're, we're trying to make it a workaholic, as they say. Let's get it at the work site as much as we possibly can and give it the resources for work. And then we're going to be stimulating it, um, kind of, yeah, yeah, doing that at mTOR through PI3K, PKB, and through uh, MAPK, and, and, and really trying to, to end some you know, mechanical signaling. And, and so the combination of all of these things is really critical. And, and I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start where we were at the very end of last lecture, and I'm only going to start and end here. I'm just going to read it. Uh, so, you know, if you're using a cell, a muscle cell, if you're using a muscle cell, consider size principle, uh, orderly recruitment, or size principle. You may need to repair that cell that you're using, and you may need to reinforce it against future bouts of that same stress. Remember when we were talking about specificity of adaptation, future bouts of stress, that's what we're adapting to. But not just any stress, future bouts of that same stress. When a cell is damaged, you get inflammatory markers. You get an inflammatory response. Immune chemicals are going to function as a marker for the magnitude of damage, the, the, the degree, the magnitude, the amount of damage, and the necessity of repair. Those chemicals provide a signal for architectural disruption. You know, you get both pain, uh, you can feel those prostaglandins, delayed onset muscle soreness, and you get chemotactic signaling, you're calling in the troops. And they initiate, those chemicals initiate repair, or you get both PKB and MAPK signaling from those chemicals. So they're telling you, ouch, ouch, ouch. They are, they are signaling how much damage was done, but they're also initiating repair. Mechanical loads are also transmitted to demonstrate what this cell is doing currently, what the cell is doing now, because what you're doing currently is a really good indicator of what you're going to need to do in the future, how you're going to need to repair and remodel in the future. So sensing of chemicals and mechanical loads, these are the signals that are necessary for repair and remodeling, regeneration, growth. They don't announce that nutrition is coming. 
they just announce need, right? We're talking need here. So maybe you have inadequate calories on board. Maybe you haven't eaten enough. There could be a famine going on, but you still need to do some translating. You need to repair. You need to, you need to regenerate these tissues. So after a major earthquake, I don't care about finances. You have to fix these buildings, right? Wherever you are in the world, there's some, let's say it's like a tornado. There's like a category whatever hurricane or like f5 or whatever it is tornado or or there it is just a giant earthquake the richter scale is some big number and you got to go repair stuff okay well we don't really have the funds to do so all right let's let's get in other other you know red cross in there let's get it there's a need to repair and that's what a lot of these chemicals and the mechanical signaling are showing is need Nutrition is another activator. It's another upstream input, promotional input. You don't want to grow. You would do best, you, you would be best to avoid growth if you lack sustenance, if you're not eating carbs, fats, and proteins, if you don't have calories on board. Nutrition is inadequate. You don't want to grow. That's bad. When a cell is presented with an abundance of calories, mTOR gets turned on. Right, you're going to turn it on when you have an abundance of nutrition. That's when it's time to grow. So mTOR, that complex, complex one, is sensitive to fed states and to fasted states, to surpluses and to scarcity. It gets turned off in scarcity. It gets turned off when you're fasting and it gets turned on in feeding. And so you don't want to translate proteins if you're shy on nutritional availability. You don't want to create proteins to consume energy if you don't have energy to spare. So mTOR detects substrate availability. That's what all those regulators, those refs, that's what they're there for, is to detect the availability of substrates. Combining leucine, lysine, arginine, uh, maybe methionine, right? Let's, let's get our, our honorable mention in there. That's gonna position mTOR. I mean, literally position it, put it in the, in the right place. At, uh, at the lysosome, it's going to put it at the job site for stimulation. So nutrition, so you have need is a stimulator, is a promoter. Nutrition is a promoter. The assumption of nutrition is another promoter. So there are a lot of ways to show your cells that you have an abundance of calories, that your mouth has been full and now your stomach and now your intestines and now your blood and now your cells are full. And so one of those ways is to actually provide the energy substrates, is to eat them, to put them in your mouth and swallow them. Like you eat a banana and some protein powder or something with some olive oil in your mouth or whatever, you need some coconut or something. Um, number two is don't provide those substrates, but promise the cell that they're coming give your word, right? Promise the cell, like, look, I, th it's not here yet, but it, it's on the way. You, like, you, you take out a loan and say, well, I'm going to pay you back. The money's coming. And so to do that, if you inject insulin, there's no calories, right? You're, okay, insulin's a protein, uh, fine, whatever, but, but that's not really what insulin's being used for. You know, you're not eating the insulin, you're injecting the insulin. And so there's no calories you're not breaking it down into its components and, and you, but you can turn on mTOR anyway. You didn't provide calories. And despite that, you're turning on the complex because there's an assumption of nutrition, right? Evolution couldn't anticipate hypodermic needles. It couldn't anticipate chemistry labs, um, behavioral uh, and chemical interventions, right? So our, our bodies assume insulin is going to be released in response to feeding. And yet here it is. So it binds and triggers mTOR. It, it, you get GLUT4 translocation, uh, but you didn't need anything, right? So just inject a bunch of insulin when you haven't eaten anything, oof, you're going to get hypoglycemic right? because the body is going to go through that PI3K, PKB, GLUT4, and mTOR signaling. So start synthesizing proteins. Calories are on the way. That's what insulin is telling the cell, even if you didn't even if you didn't uh, eat anything. And so this, it's similar if you, if you think about the scent of food and salivation. Uh, 
if you know you ring the bell and, and the dog spit starts starts pooling that's what this is doing there's a promise of food that's on the way a promise of calories and so insulin is a mechanism by which the muscle smells its coming substrates so the assumption of nutrition and when you start combining these things over here we have proteins mobilizing uh, mTOR to to the lysosome over here we have uh, an abundance of carbohydrates and or we have a growth factors right so we have a diverse set of nutrients coming in protein for the rags those rag gtp aces carbs for the reb over here and to, to turn on reb right to, to allow it to keep its gtp and so if you're eating a broad colorful abundant diet okay, growth seems reasonable. It's unthreatening to metabolic fitness. Growth is unthreatening to metabolic fitness in that case, because there's an abundance of calories and, and a, a, a broad diet on board. Or you have protein on board and you're, you are, uh, you can rearrange those proteins, use their building blocks, you know, use the individual amino acids to reconstruct better, newer proteins, more appropriate proteins for your, for your fitness, for your metabolic fitness. Maybe you're shy on gross calories. Maybe you haven't eaten enough carbohydrate, but you have some prostaglandins. You have a bunch of cytokines going. You have some insulin-like growth factor uh, sending signals. So you have, you have proteins, and you have you know, IGF and stuff. And so that's sufficient to stimulate mTOR. Now, moving on to AMPK, adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase, AMP activated protein kinase. Now this is, th these diagrams are sort of crude, imprecise, um, if you open up just your average undergraduate physiology textbook, textbook you see this, this introductory diagram of, of enzymes and their importance. It illustrates a point without any precision. And when that point is we are improving in aerobic metabolism. And as we improve in aerobic metabolism and endurance sports, what accounts for that change? What permits our improvement? Well, you see VO2 max going up and uh, over months of training, here's the year, the one year mark, you know, so you don't train for a month and suddenly you're an all-star, right? You have to train for a really long time. Here's the two year mark. And, and you see metabolic enzymes, you know, percent change increasing. And over here, what are these percent changes? Again, this is sort of very unrefined. This, this isn't like from the results of this study, here's the exact percentage refining. These are just giving you this impression of, of what changes in your body. Um, AVO2 difference and um, the you know total cardiac output and oxygen uptake and capillary density. Capillary density is something that takes a long time. You can, blood volume happens rapidly. Blood volume very rapidly. That's going to be changing. Go work out a few times and you're seeing you know, you know, more, more blood volume. But oxidative enzymes, capillary density just takes forever, but that thing lasts a lot longer. Blood volume, you just become very inactive and you find yourself peeing a lot. Oxidative enzymes, ah, yeah, these things change a lot. Enzymes, Enzymes are so important to human performance. They're just, the, again, as we go back to this idea of metabolism, enzymes are metabolism. It's the foundation of metabolism. It's, it's the summation of all these chemical reactions that, that, they're, that they're facilitating. And so for endurance metabolism, what we're looking at is uh, more, uh, you know, a greater density of, of all of these enzymes, you know, these mitochondrial enzymes, we have glycolytic enzymes, we have fatty acid <clears throat> enzymes, wherever you are in the body, the Krebs cycle, what's that? Well, it's a bunch of enzymes. What's glycolysis? It's a bunch of enzymes. What's lipolysis? Well, it's a bunch of enzymes. What's glycogenolysis? It's a bunch of, it's a bunch of enzymes. The creatine kinase reaction, right? If, if we're going to reassemble ATP, let's just donate a phosphate from, from phosphocreatine or creatine phosphate. That creatine kinase, you have um, you know, dental uh, cyclase and dental kinase, and and we have. I mean, wherever you are in the body, it's just enzymes, metabolism, all these different enzymes. So endurance metabolism. Let's just ramp up a lot of this this enzyme activity. 
uh, there's a question. Does timing of insulin spike equal mTOR signaling immediately before or after maximal? Uh, does it affect maximal hypertrophy? Yeah. Now, insulin is anabolic in a lot of ways. If you've known somebody who's who's supplemented with insulin as a as a drug, just start injecting insulin as a as an anabolic drug, you'll notice some adiposity climbing onto the to the uh, form too. And but but yeah, insulin is is very anabolic and and. Uh, if you can get a spike, you're, you're, you're likely to, to elicit that sort of response. So enzymatic adaptations for strength and hypertrophy, if you want to grow, we're looking at attenuating some of this response at, at reducing some of the activity of these, of these enzymes. Now you want to turn on things like PI3K, PKB, you know, MAPK, you want to turn these things on, but to do so, a lot of this is going to be attenuating the activity of other enzymes and AMPK, AMP activated protein kinase is a big one. Um, and so AMPK in, in terms of skeletal muscle activity, it's just a huge inhibitor, massive inhibitor of mTOR. And the purpose of AMPK is not like, ha ha ha, I'm going to make you shrink. I'm going to create barriers to your goals. That's not what AMPK is doing, right? It's not a barrier it's, uh, enzyme. It's trying to regulate and succeeding, unless you have weird mutations, it is succeeding in regulating the energy status of your muscles uh, during whatever activity you're doing. So it's sensing energy levels and it is responding accordingly. At the same time though, it phosphorylates raptor, it inhibits raptor. And so here's a little article that has you know, nice um, this over diagram and it, it just, you know, the phosphorylation site on Raptor, when you see AMPK is phosphorylating over there and that inhibits Raptor. As you know, Raptor is recruiting the downstream target. So, so it's inhibiting mTOR at Raptor. It's also inhibiting at tuberin. AMPK is, is turning on tuberin. It's turning off Raptor. It's turning on tuberin. And tuberin is the thing that's shutting off REB, um, hydrolyzing, uh, facilitating the hydrolysis of REB's GTP and so GDP bound, that's not helpful. You need GTP bound to activate mTOR. And this seems that there's some, the, uh, maybe some mTOR, some direct interaction. And the, the data here are a little bit limited. So don't bother with this one, bother with the last two. Bother with those two huge interaction points at Raptor and at Tuberin. But there's definitely additional roles in hypertrophy that AMPK plays. And maybe here, right? Maybe there's something here. This isn't, the information I provide today and four lectures before this are not like everything that will ever be known about mTOR. State of evidence, we're, we're, we're doing a state of the union address on uh, hypertrophy and muscle metabolism and fitness from the perspective of muscle physiology. Now, a a AMPK, in almost every single article, we're seeing it being regarded as this, quote, key enzyme in cellular energy deficits and, and it manages energy consumption and it's increasing mechanisms that are going to produce energy in the form of ATP. Let's get a bunch of ATP on board. And it decreases, it, it reduces uh, consumption of energy. Whatever is, is running up the electric bill, it is going to cease that thing's activity. So that's what AMPK is doing. It's a sensor and it regulates. So if you think of it as St. Peter, if you can think of AMPK as St. Peter, but like the Far Side comic version, if, if you're aware of Far Side comics, Gary Larson, this, this guy who, uh, I don't know if he's still alive, but, but there used to, everyone used to have in the 90s, everyone had these little desk calendars and just some little cartoon and sort of these silly um, scenes. And, and from that perspective of what St. Peter does, you, know, you go up to the pearly gates and St. Peter says, nope, you're going to hell. And the next person, yeah, all right, come on in. Come on, you can join the party. Next person, yeah, you can come in too. Next person, you're going to hell. And so this, this uh, divine doorman, right? Sort of the, the heavenly 
decider of of who goes who's who's you know permitted uh, entrance and and who's rejected, and this is just my little reference of Michael Stipe. There's there's a really good song in my estimation where it says you know here's a truck stop instead of St. Peter's, but St. Peter, that's what what AMPK is. It's this decider. All right, you're anabolic now. Oh, all right, you're catabolic. No no more of this growth stuff. You're catabolic. And when AMPK decides, the cells just obey. I mean, it, it really decides if you're growing or shrinking. And because it, it'll it'll turn on atrophy, it will AMPK will turn on atrophy, and it will turn off hypertrophy. I mean, it's it just sort of goes all out. Or it's like, all right, I I I I'm withdrawing my inhibition. Go ahead and uh, you know have your ruckus, right? This is this is this is your time to kind of uh, rough house, have at it. And it's like the purge, but the opposite, where, where it's sort of all. Uh, growth. And so that's what AMP activated protein kinase is doing. It's a kinase, it's phosphorylating stuff, and it's activated by, by AMP. And so when you look at, at you know, normal conditions, there, you don't have that much AMP. There's not that much AMP floating around, and so AMPK is, is inactive. Well, what do you do to, to accumulate AMP where do you get it from? We'll start exercising. Go start going through uh, ATP hydrolysis. Start chopping up your ATP, hydrolyze your ATP. And the first thing you get is a bunch of ADP, right? But then um, you, can you can combine two ADPs to create an ATP and an AMP. Uh, and we'll go over that uh, reaction in just a second. But uh, the more AMP you have, a AMPK is sensing that. It's a, it's a sensor of AMP, and uh, it can bind to the gamma subunit. There's an alpha, a beta, and a gamma subunit on AMPK. And the upstream stuff that's going to phosphorylate it, that's going to activate it, LKB1, we're going to turn on AMPK. That's the alpha subunit. The gamma subunit that's where amp adp atp that's where that stuff is going to bind and so you go through atp hydrolysis you have your atp you have water right atp ace ace meaning enzyme atp ace you chop up your atp you hydrolyze it you have your adp and your phosphate over here and a floating off hydrogen ion now this and this both become important in terms of muscular fatigue. This one, especially for like the burning sensation, but for muscular fatigue, this is also critical for muscular fatigue, that ATP, ADP ratio. But you get a bunch of ADP with, with uh, ATP hydrolysis. Now, you're exercising, you keep exercising. And so you don't stop exercising as soon as you create a bunch of ADP. Oh, I'm done, all done. I gotta get my ATP back. Hold off. Let me let me just you know, take a break. You don't do that. So you keep jogging. You keep doing your whatever thrusts and pull up things and stuff. And so you use adenylate kinase, that enzyme, adenylate kinase. This is not adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase converts ATP into cyclic AMP. That is PKA activation. Adenylate cyclase, you're going to activate PKA with all that Sickle AMP that you've created from ATP. Adenylate kinase, a kinase, you have um, two ADPs. You have two ADPs and you have four total phosphates here. Well, ATP needs three. All right. I'm gonna I'm just gonna give take from one and give to the other. And but that leaves us with an AMP. So the adenylate kinase reaction produces a bunch of AMP. Now, when you're at rest, your AMP is super low, ADP is relatively low. During exercise, AMP goes up way more than this, actually. Depending on the intensity of exercise, AMP goes way up. ADP goes up quite a bit. AMP goes way up, and ATP goes down some. ATP, now this looks like it's going down like 20%, but uh, that's sort of a whole tissue level. If you're using, if you're just exclusively looking at one, you know, type 2X fiber, you're, you're exerting yourself all ferociously, uh, you might be able to get it down to like 20% of, of that one fiber's resting values. But ATP really doesn't go down that much overall. ATP doesn't go down that much. ADP goes up some, a fair amount. 
AMP uh, during this prolonged and intense exercise, it, re it really goes way up. Now, AMP binds to the gamma subunit on AMPK. And that changes its conformation, right? It, it, that, that, that actually permits the binding of a second one, um, of, of another AMP um, to this gamma subunit. But the upstream activators, the upstream activators can now phosphorylate the alpha subunit. You can now activate it. And we've talked about liver kinase B1. Don't think of it as a liver enzyme. This is this is ubiquitous. It's in tons of it in skeletal muscle. That just happens to LKB1. And you don't need to remember the, the full names of these things. Um, calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase beta, that's this one. Um, calcium, this little CA right there. What that's for is it's, it's not actually, it's, that's not as much about the ATP, AMP as it is about ion levels, about calcium, about intracellular calcium regulation by means other than energy, ATP, ATP, AMP. And, and so you don't you don't need to know these these other things transforming growth factor whatever kinase you don't you don't need to know these things LKB one is the only one you need to know and the uh, ATP AMP ratio is going to affect the gamma subunit which permits activation by LKB one the beta subunit that's where carbs bind. Uh, glycogen specifically is going to bind to the beta subunit. Now, once you have a bunch of AMP, you can deaminate it. You can deaminate your AMP through a nicely named enzyme, AMP deaminase. So you get inosine monophosphate pneumonia. You no longer have AMP, so you're not interacting with uh, AMPK anymore. If you use AMP deaminase to eliminate your AMP levels, you are no longer interacting with AMPK. So remember this, we're going to come back to this little part when we start talking about drugs. Now, again, the, the, the regulatory subunits are beta and gamma. The regulatory are beta and gamma. And gamma is where AMP is going to bind. And this is the thing that really you see uh, activating it. So the LKB1 uh, can can phosphorylate the active the the alpha site to 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 turn it on, but AMP has to bind there first. The first molecule binds and enhances the binding of the second. You get this little shape change, and then so a small AMP concentration increase once you facilitate that first bind, you facilitate the second. So a small uh, change in AMP is is likely to have a larger effect. And just, just again, this, this article is, is saying that uh, AMPK is a cellular energy sensor, uh, AMP, ADP, ATP, the levels of these things, of AMP, ADP, and ATP, this is your energy levels. If you run out of ATP, see you later, you're dead, right? So you, your body has to preserve ATP at all times. And, you know, when we went through sliding filament theory, cross-bridge cycling, and uh, we're talking about like rigor mortis and you need ATP in order to transition to the, to the weak bond uh, so that the myosin head can, can release and, and uh, you need ATP here. If you run out of ATP, you're, you're no longer functioning, you're no longer alive. And, and so you need to sense your ATP levels and, and to reconstitute your juice your, your, your ATP. And, and there's a few binding sites for these things. You don't need to know anything specific about it. Just the gamma subunit. That's where AMP, ADP, and ATP can bind. Now, ATP, if it's binding, this is inhibiting AMPK. ATP, I have a, I have a ton of energy. AMPK, stop all that nonsense. We have tons of energy to spare. You, you, you don't need to be running. Um, you don't need to be conservative in this moment. Tons of energy. We have tons of ATP binding. Uh, if you're low on ATP, ADP and AMP both promote AMPK. AMP is the real thing that's going to turn it on. Um, ADP is more about, now some authors will argue, but it seems to be more about 
behavior once it's on. AMP is going to activate it and then and then it's functioning. You know, is something is some phosphatase going to deactivate uh, the the alpha subunit? Are we going to are we going to take that phosphate off of its of of what's activating it? And and uh, ADP seems to to be preventing that pretty effectively. So ADP has its role. AMP has its a larger role, but not everybody is going to is going to accept that. Um, so this is just saying that you know, AMP binding increases the binding of, of another AMP uh, a lot. And this is where, where um, the ADP is explained a little bit, protecting against the dephosphorylation. So there's, AMP does a few things. We're going to activate its, its kinase activity, AMP kinase, right? We're going to, we, we are going AMP activated protein kinase. We're going to activate this kinase uh, activity and uh, promote its activation, its phosphorylation upstream by LKB1, and then uh, protect it against dephosphorylation. ADP is also protecting against dephosphorylation. This is an article, it's brand new, uh, and they talk about you can just see what they're saying. ADP is a dominant controller of AMP activated protein kinase activity in, in skeletal muscle during exercise. You know, first AMP is likely still crucial, but but ADP is is very critical in in, in dynamic variation of AMPK. I'm not going to ask you anything about this. This is just to say that um, some authors hold ADP to a more important in a more important light. They, they cast this more important light on it. I don't know if it's true, but just because there's something that's unsettled and, and I shrug my shoulders or I express doubt doesn't mean that my my opinion is fact forever on, on that particular issue. So maybe ADP is super important. I just, it seems like AMP is the, is a real activator and not just because of the name, right? That could be a misnomer, uh, AMP activated protein kinase, but because AMP is the thing that's really turning it on and, and making it permissible for the upstream kinase to activate it, which initiates its activity. But all I'm saying here is ADP is very likely still playing a pretty important role uh, AMP is the most important of them, though. And uh, glycogen. If you have a bunch of glycogen, it, it can bind to the beta subunit. And I don't know how to make you, you know, encourage you to remember that. If there's a, oh, you know, there's a gamma subunit and glycogen doesn't bind to gamma because they both start with G and that would make sense. So let's not do that. Whatever, however you're gonna you're gonna remember this that glycogen is going to bind to the beta uh, subunit, and so it is helpful to have a bunch of carbohydrate on board, and then they just to season that to, to throw some salt and pepper and and um, whatever some thyme and oregano on on that not for a test sake, but the nature of that carbohydrate of that of that glycogen does matter a little bit too. That can affect it's beta binding, uh, the branching characteristics of glycogen, you know, how it branches, uh, the particle size of it matters. So the characteristics of the glycogen are important in, in its ability to inhibit AMPK activity, but a bunch of carbohydrate is sensed. And it, it makes sense because carbohydrate levels, AMPK is calling carbohydrates into the cell. AMPK is mobilizing GLUT4. It's mobilizing GLUT4 to get more carbohydrates into the cell. And so it's helpful to know the status of carbohydrates in the cell. It makes sense that you would be able to sense that thing. And But, but AMPK is promoting glycolysis. AMPK is turning on glycolysis at hexokinase, so glucose is being converted to G6P and at PFK. Remember earlier, we talked about the rate limiting step of, of glycolysis, what that means, um, rate limited by ATP. If you have an abundance of ATP, you get an allosteric uh, inhibition of PFK. And so what we have is AMPK promoting the intake of carbs and promoting the consumption of carbs. Insulin just promotes the intake. Insulin promotes glycogen synthase 
to, to link everything together and store more carbohydrate. AMPK says, let's get carbs into the, into the cell, but let's actually burn them at the same time. So if you have diabetes, AMPK is what you want to activate, not insulin. You want to activate AMPK where you actually burn up those carbohydrates. Now there is something fascinating, uh, counterintuitive, this sort of this, this, this backward assumption where if you have chronic activation, constant, uh, unrelenting activation of AMPK, um, you seem to get more glycogen accumulation. And that doesn't quite make sense initially you know, until, you, until you explore it in some, in some detail. It doesn't make sense because AMPK is halting glycogen uh, synthase. AMPK is, is obstructing, it's, it's inhibiting glycogen synthase. So you shouldn't be linking together a bunch of carbs to a bunch of sugar to make glycogen. But chronic AMPK action, you do get a lot of glucose uptake, a lot of GLUT4 translocation, a lot of, a lot of glucose uptake, and <clears throat> you are promoting hexokinase. So you're getting a ton of G6P, glucose 6-phosphate, a ton of it. And G6P is going to initiate glycogen synthase. So it probably depends on ratios of things. It probably depends on values of, of well, you know, how much um, G6P do we have and what, how much you know, to promote glycogen synthase and, and how much AMPK is trying to inhibit it and, and these values of things. So chronic responses aren't always the same thing as acute responses, but the acute effect of AMPK, that's the only one you need to know. The acute effect of AMPK, get sugar into the cell and burn it. Get sugar into the cell and, and glycolysis as a verb, it. Glycolyse it. And that's what AMPK is doing very effectively. So it's, it is sensing, AMPK is sensing carbohydrate availability in the cell by having its glycogen uh, binding site. That beta subunit is going to bind to the glycogen. Now, for a number of reasons, don't memorize anything on this, on this slide, but just for a number of reasons, realize that nutrient-deprived and nutrient-rich situations of mTOR are profoundly different, both in carbohydrates and its, uh, its impact on insulin signaling or, or its deprivation on AMPK, right? And so carb carbohydrates affect AMPK and they affect PI3K and, and protein affects the mobilization of mTOR. And, and the behavior of all of these components are very sensitive to nutrient availability. And they should be, they should be, because if you're translating a bunch of protein, super expensive, you are running up that, that credit card. And if you don't have the funds to pay it off, bankruptcy is death bankruptcy in the body is death. You better be able to pay off those, your credits, um, your debts. And so mTOR is really sensitive to, to carbohydrates and, and sustenance availability, really. And so the reviews so far for AMPK, the metabolic dictator, right, it's this despot up, up at the, um, at its lectern shouting speeches and, 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 and demanding obedience. I mean, AMPK is really uh, giving instruction with a raspy, veiny throat and everyone just obeys uh, AMPK. So ATP hydrolysis happens. We hydrolyze our ATP. So ATP plus water um, and uh, ATPase is the enzyme. You get ADP, a phosphate, that little eyes like inorganic, right? there's no hydrocarbon bonds here, um, no carbon in it, and a hydrogen ion, a little proton over here. And so you, what you need here, there's H2O, you need one of those H's and the O to plug this up, right? You, you, you chop a, a phosphate off of your ATP and you need to plug it up. Um, you know, you clot, you remember the clotting cascade? It's almost the same. It's like, this is like chemical clotting. Um, you have to plug that up with an O and an H, but there's a second H, where does that go? Well, it's over here. And so this is where your pH changes, um, your pH, right? Hydrogen ion, uh, this little proton goes floating off and it burns and stuff. So you do that. And now we have ADP. 
All right, you're exercising, you get a bunch of ADP. Then you get the adenylic kinase reaction. ADP plus ADP, uh, there's four phosphates to go around, right? We need ATP back. And so you get your ATP and an AMP. Um, so you take one phosphate and kinase it over here. You, you, you phosphorylate one of these, so you, re you remove and give. Um, so Robin Hood, right? But everyone's sort of equal and you still just you know, take from one and give to the, what is now rich. You create rich and poor, right? whatever's like the opposite of Robin Hood. Now you have ATP and AMP competing for binding on those gamma subunits. The more AMP you have, the more AMP is going to bind. And again, ADP binds to, and there are authors that say, authors who say that it is important that it is regulating some of the some of the activity of, of AMPK, but AMP is really seems to be the major activator. Not the activator like LKB1 is a thing that's going to uh, phosphorylate the the alpha subunit, so it's, it's not the you know that's the kinase that actually turns it on, but you need AMP to up to permit the upstream kinase to activate it. And binding of the first AMP on that gamma subunit en enhances binding of the second. As soon as you got these AMPs bound, you have LKB1 activating, um, activating on the on the uh, alpha subunit. So now your AMPK is on, and there's lots of stuff that's going to promote. AMPK activity, and you could guess this without looking at the slide. You could guess this stuff. Exercise, go get on a recumbent bike for a while, you know, ride the bike or jog or get in a boxing ring or wrestling or whatever. Go exercise, do, do sort of high volume resistance training where it's sort of set after set after set with no rest and sort of low uh, weight set, you know, 20 rep sets and then and then immediately transition to something else and just keep consuming ATP at the highest rate you can. Not like you do one set and wait five minutes, um, but sort of uh, really consume a lot of ATP and exercise. Well, you know how that works, right? ATP hydrolysis and then adenylate kinase. Now you have a bunch of AMP, right? Hypoxia, you're going to inhibit the aerobic production of, of ATP. So that's going to be a little bit uh, you know, just just climb the mountain and do some aerobic activity. Uh, okay, well now you're going to get even more AMP, AMP-ish. You're going to AMP-ish, impish, and starvation, glucose deprivation. Right, go on a go on a ketogenic diet, something like that, and you're going to limit uh, carbohydrate availability. You're going to limit uh, resources and. Uh, in general, and and that can stimulate AMPK. But then exercise in the presence of of any of those things. Go to Denver. Go stay at like the Hyatt in Denver, and get on the twenty whatever th floor, and run up and down the stairs at the Hyatt in Denver. Someday maybe we'll do that together because because um, uh, when we do our conference presentations, uh, every once in a while, uh, ACSM is hosted in Denver. So do that as an exercise and you will activate AMPK. Now this is just my little drawing of the important stuff. Okay, we have glycogen binding to the beta subunit. And again, it depends on the characteristics of glycogen. Who cares? Who cares? An abundance of glycogen? Sure, bind to the, to the beta subunit and that's going to inhibit AMPK. ATP AMP ratio. Is ADP important? Yeah, but whatever, I don't care. Like AMP um, is, is going to AMP activated protein kinase, right? You're, you're going to um, promote the activation by LKB1, and you're gonna you're gonna ward off dephosphorylation. You're gonna ward off a phosphatase removing that phosphate. So let's try to keep this thing activated uh, for as long as we can. Uh, if you have a bunch of AMP still bound, now downstream we see mitochondrial biogenesis. Let's make more mitochondria. That's good for, for energy, uh, for long-term energy. GLUT4 translocation. Let's get some carbs into the cell. Hormone-sensitive lipase. Let's, let's build more ATP lipolytically. Um, you know what hormone-sensitive lipase. We went through that a ton with the PKA signaling. And it's going to halt glycogen synthase. What you're going to do is get carbs into the cell through GLUT4, halt glycogen synthase. We don't want to put this stuff together. Let's inhibit this thing. Insulin is going to promote this. AMPK is going to inhibit it. AMPK is also going to turn on hexokinase and PFK. So we're going to burn those carbs. We're going to burn fat. We're going to burn carbs. We're going to get carbs into the cell. We're going to increase 
mitochondria, right? So that's what LK, what uh, AMPK is doing. There's a little bit more to it. Um, you don't need to know all of this stuff, but you do see, I mean, there's the hormone sensitive lipase. Here's the, the mitochondrial uh, biogenesis. There's GLUT4 translocation. Here's the you know, glycogen synthase, the upstream activators. Um, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting, where you see the fitness piece, sort of a chronic fitness piece, acute and chronic, but a big chronic part here, where AMPK is turning on tubrin. It's a kinase, right? Let's phosphorylate some stuff. Let's turn on tubrin, and that's going to cause uh, REB to hydrolyze its GTP to GDP, and so we can no longer activate mTOR. And, and AMPK is also going to inhibit Raptor, so good luck getting these guys, these downstream targets. Uh, AMPK is going to turn on protein degradation, both autophagy, the lysosomal system, and the ubiquitin proteasome system. And mTOR and AMPK are going to do this in a very different way. They're going to interact in a very different way on these things. Um, and so this um, autophagy activating kinase you know what autophagy is, autophagy. The ubiquitin proteasome system is, it's a bunch of ubiquitin tags. Think of it like little kick me signs. It's a bunch of little kick me signs that you place on misfolded proteins, uh, that you place on damaged proteins or unnecessary proteins and you sort of jettison them you know jettison it like if you're on a boat and it's going down you throw unnecessary luggage off to keep from sinking that's really what the ubiquitin proteasome system is doing is is like all right we gotta jettison some of this stuff just throw it overboard we're, we're going down here with metabolism we, we got we got to get rid of some of the unnecessary luggage yeah keep the food on board throw the diamonds over what are diamonds gonna do you can't eat them and no, 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 keep the cigarettes. That's what people would say. And so AMPK, we are turning on this system, um, whereas mTOR is going to be inhibiting uh, this system. And, and AMPK, you're going to be putting more and more and more kick me tags um, of those ubiquitin tags on more and more and more proteins to degrade more and more and more of this stuff. And you're really, you're, you're kicking undeserving proteins at some point. Um, whereas mTOR, if you leave mTOR on for too long, it's like, no, 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 don't break that one down. I can still find you. You sort of, there's like a spectrum of um, hoarder and consumer. And mTOR becomes a protein hoarder. No, 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 I, I still want to use that. It's just like used, you know, like aluminum foil. Ah, I can find something for it, you know. Whereas AMPK is just, is is cleaning out the closets. That's what AMPK is doing. It's sort of throwing away too much. Oh, I could have sold that on eBay, right? I, I could have put a down payment on a house with those. He so threw away all my whatever, my whatever, like old, you know, my old Pokemon or, or whatever it is you threw away my beanie babies or, or something. And this is just saying that, that AMPK and, M, and uh, mTOR, these are phosphorylating different targets on this UNC51, UNC51, like um, autophagy activating protein. Kinase. You, don't need, you don't need to know what this thing is. It's just, it's a, it's a it is a, another like cutoff man, right? Or cutoff woman for a play at the softball plate. And so it's this, it, it activates autophagy, autophagy, self, you know, dining. And, but AMPK and mTOR, they're phosphorylating this thing, right? These are both kinases and they're phosphorylating this thing on different targets and, and for promotion or, or inhibition. The ubiquitin proteasome pathway, this is a major system of protein degradation, huge system of protein degradation. And as I said, you just, you're tagging, you're putting multiple um, ubiquitin tags. You just put one on there and you just, you keep your eye on it, right? You get, you get a few tags on there and then it's like Sauron's eye, you know, you're, you're ready to destroy this thing. And, and the proteasome is, is what's doing the proteolysis. All right. So we have some upstream variables here. We have, we have some upstream um, activators 
of AMPK. And you see stuff like Icar and metformin and resveratrol. That's the thing in, in wine that's so healthy and it's, and it's promoting LKB1's activation of, of AMPK. That's really how a lot of these, Icar is a drug, we'll talk about it. Metformin is a diabetes drug, we'll talk about it. But you should really, let me ignore what's down here, but you should really start recognizing most stuff on here. That's just insulin receptor substrate. You know PI3K converts PIP2 to PIP3. P10, right? This is this is phosphatase and tensin homolog. This is um, converting PIP3 back into PIP2. Um, so it's inhibiting PKB, where PI3K is promoting PKB. PKB is inhibiting the forehead boxo, the foxos, and, and AMPK is activating it. Down here, we see tuberin, we see red, we see mTOR, we see raptor, and PRESS40, uh, PRAS40, that's the, that's the inhibiting protein. It's a negative regulator of mTOR. PKB is phosphorylating that thing. You know it's downstream targets. And this, just think down here, this is, we're making protein. We're making a bunch of protein hypertrophy we're growing. You see rapamycin uh, inhibiting. So rapamycin, that FKBP12 site, that's uh, rapamycin's interaction. And so most of this stuff, there's the LKB1 and it's the, the alpha up here, right? LKB1 is activating the alpha site, gamma. Um, this, is, this is where the AMP, uh, ATP is binding. Beta, that's the subunit where the, it looks like the beta subunit is phosphorylating. It's not, that's just that the, the arrows are weird. But as we get into things like resveratrol, well, how does resveratrol work? Well, you have to have LKB1 doing this thing. It's facilitating. It's it's a sidekick for LKB1 to activate AMPK. So the thing in red wine, it's in grapes. You don't have to get wasted to get it, or you can just take it as a pill. I actually have resveratrol on my shelf, on my on my little pill shelf. And we'll talk about supplements, uh, the supplements that work, and, and a lot of the supplements that work. It's going to be through an mTOR interaction. Not all of them, you know. Creatine is is not really an mTOR response, although increased workload. Maybe you'll see some some uh, consequent uh, some sh mTOR shrapnel being being fired. But but you know, there's a lot of supplements that have nothing to do with mTOR. But but there are many that do, and we'll talk about them and. Uh, but resveratrol, the thing in grapes that's so healthy, and, and that's just facilitating LKB1's activation of AMPK, and AMPK is wonderful for lifespan. And um, ICAR, this, this one is, people are using this thing in, in cycling. So we now have like the New York Times, doping cloud still looms over a thrilling Tour de France. So this is 2019. And it, this is a banned performance enhancing drug in um, in, in cycling. Uh, so it, it works so well to activate uh, AMPK, um, to get it activated. And uh, so reactive oxygen species, we keep talking about reactive oxygen species and their very versatile roles in the body. Over here, they're activating, um, uh, you know, mTOR. And over here, they're, they're, they're you know, degrading proteins. So, so this very broad role of reactive oxygen species in the body, you don't really need to know much about it, but appreciate that um, they are all over the place. And AMPK's action is doing a ton of things. There's a ton of super healthy, healthy. <laughs> okay, let's, let's stick with healthy. I was gonna say healthy, but it does help. It's very healthy. Um, it does healthy things in the body uh, for, for cardiovascular health and for, um, uh, I mean, just like even, like ICAR, that drug, the AICAR, it's an AMP mimetic so it mimics AMP. It's a drug that's been used since the 80s, but what's it for? Heart health. You know, you're going to have a heart attack. Oh, you better be on this stuff. And it just happens to be banned in Tour de France because it, it works really well for, for you know, mitochondrial biogenesis stuff because AMPK is so healthy, right? It's, it's going to prolong life, but it's great for your heart at the same time. I mean, a heart drug is, is, so, is so helpful. Now, metformin, this is the diabetes drug, really famous diabetes drug, and it inhibits AMP deaminase. So this is earlier, I said, remember this, we're going to come back to this with drugs. 
when you go through the adenylic kinase reaction, and so, so ADP plus ADP, you get your ATP and AMP. When you go through that reaction, now you have AMP. You have to dispose of your AMP. And my Fitbit just said I got my 250th step of the hour. I've been lecturing here all hour. I guess I'm just very active in my wrists as I, as I talk to you. But uh, that AMP deaminase is how you dispose of your of your AMP. And metformin is inhibiting AMP deaminase. So what would that do? Think in terms of AMPK, AMP activated protein kinase. If you're eliminating AMP deaminase, you are accumulating AMP. What happens to your AMPK? Well, you activate it. You activate a bunch of, of AMPK. Now, as a diabetes drug, what are you trying to do? Well, you know, we got to get some sugar out of the blood. We got to burn some sugar. AMPK, that, that is your best friend. You think dogs and puppies and whatever are like man and woman and child's best friend? AMPK, if you have diabetes, that's your best friend. You take the puppy to the pound, right? This is your best friend because this is going to prolong your life. This is essentially curing your diabetes. It's, it's getting the sugar out of your blood and not just into the cell where it's going to store it. That's what insulin is going to do. Store, store, store. Let's amass carbs. Like, okay, you amass all these carbohydrates and you're getting a bunch of glycogen from insulin and glycogen is going to inhibit AMPK and AMPK is what you actually want. Insulin isn't all that friendly to, for, for somebody with diabetes. AMPK, that's what you need because you get it into the cell and then you and then you go through glycolysis and you burn it up and you get a bunch of ATP and there's, there's that's not a, that's not like a, you know, an excess of ATP in a cell that's not causing retinopathy and distal neuropathy. So AMPK is going to be your best friend here. Metformin is a way of, of getting more AMPK activated. Now get outside of diabetes and, and let's, let's get extreme here. Schizophrenia. Don't remember schizophrenia and, and this, this, you know, uh, clozapine. Don't, don't, don't remember this, but do remember metformin. I'll, I'll probably test you on metformin because it is such a huge common drug and it is just critical to mTOR. Now, if you're, if you are a, a you know, Olympic uh, lifter, or you're a power lifter, or or you're a sprinter, or you're a bodybuilder, you do not want metformin. I mean, because you're just activating a bunch of AMPK. And so what happens to protein anabolism? See you later, right? That wave just got me like 10 steps on my Fitbit. Um, but, but don't remember this one. This is just to say that as we get in broader outside of things like Ronnie Coleman, Right. I'm not just talking big biceps here. I'm, I, this is a critical metabolic pathway to everything ever, to every single biological process is a metabolic one in the end. And schizophrenia, you see this decreased PKB signaling, AKT PKB signaling, and uh, glycogen synthase kinase 3, you, you know what that one is. And so this uh, pathway is in the brains is, is being messed up. And you take clozapine and you're improving it. Well, how are you improving it? Well, you see, if, if you take um, just clozapine by itself, you see more plasma insulin. And in the hippocampus, you're seeing AKT, PKB, right? There's the same thing. You see PKB activation. If you take a bunch of clozapine and you have schizophrenia, you're seeing increased PKB signaling in the hypothalamus. Wonderful, probably from a bunch of plasma insulin, but, but yeah, wonderful. But if you take your um, insulin inhibitor, uh, you don't see that effect and you, you don't see the effect with PKB. So sometimes when you're looking at these drug effects in major diseases, you're just looking at a bunch of metabolism and you now know that metabolism. You're looking at uh, PI3K, PKB, mTOR signaling. And or you're looking at uh, MAPK, or you're looking at uh, AMPK. You, that's really what you're looking at when you... Um, uh, when, when you're looking at these different drug classes, now not always, and that's not always what you're looking at with, with supplements. But once AMPK is activated, um, you know, why would it stop mTOR? A why question. Again, let's go back to St. Peter. mTOR is so expensive, super expensive mTOR is. And so 
the reason you're going to stop it is it's just you're you're running up the electric bill, right? It's not just one light switch. You're just ramping up the electric bill, and so you got to turn that thing down. And if you're going to save money, uh, yeah, okay, we're going to get some carbs into the cell. We're going to burn some fat. We're going to burn some carbs. We're, we're, we're going to degrade some proteins. And, and let's look long term, let's get some more mitochondria, but let's shut down this mTOR thing. I mean, it's really running up the bill. So if if it's like a national debt, all right, what's so expensive? Oh, well, energy and, and the, you know, the war that we're fighting and, and whatever overseas is super expensive. And all right, we got to start withdrawing money and some reason we'll, we'll withdraw it from, not from like military expenditures, but let's draw it from education and Thing. So, but if if the government behaved a little bit more like biology, I think we would have a healthier country. We're we're becoming more and more a third world country. Um, but so AMPK is it, it's going to stop mTOR because mTOR is so expensive. It's burning so much energy. Now, it, just take a bunch of mice who are deficient in AMPK, and you can get them huge. I mean, they, they their musculature develops. Uh, faster and has a, has a larger kind of growth ceiling, just have them go do some mechanical loading and they're much more responsive to it. If you lean AMPK toward negative, toward inhibition, you're going to grow more. If you increase AMPK, you're going to get muscle atrophy and you know why, you know why. Um, uh, autophagy and, and uh, you're going to start um, the ubiquitin proteasome system and lysosomal uh, degrega uh, degradation. You, you, you are going to initiate uh, atrophy if you increase AMPK activity. So that leads to, to uh, researchers saying things like it's a metabolic master switch. It is this major on or off for a metabolism switch. And it's not just what your cells are doing, it's also affecting your behavior. AMPK affects your behavior. So in the hypothalamus, remember when we were doing hormones, I don't know, 10 lectures ago or something, we were going through hormones, a hypothalamic pituitary, whatever axis, and the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is controlling a lot of your functions, all of your Fs, those functions and food and fluids, and those are some of those Fs. And if something inhibits appetite, if something is an appetite suppressant, you're inhibiting AMPK in the hypothalamus. AMPK is trying to get more calories on board. It's trying to get more ATP. It's noticing uh, a, a metabolic, an energy deficit, uh, scarcity, a, a, you know, caloric scarcity, and it's trying to remedy that. AMPK is trying to fix caloric or energy scarcity. And so one way of doing that is, is let's do a bunch of lipolysis and let's, let's do a bunch of, of, um, you know, uh, glycolysis and, and, and let's, let's try to create as much ATP as we can, but also put a bunch of food in your mouth, go eat, eat now. And so AMPK is going to promote feeding. It's going to make you hungry. So if something stimulates appetite, AMPK is, is probably the culpable agent there uh, in stimulating it. So the munchies, right? If you, like if it's Friday after class, you have your pipe ready or your gummies or whatever. I mean, just eat a couple of those you know, THC gummies, get get these cannabinoids on board, and then suddenly you're just eager to eat more gummies because it's food, not because it's THC, but because you're excited for the food part of it. And, and so that is what's causing that. So you know how these same signaling cascades, this is in the hypothalamus, but exactly what we're talking about for skeletal muscle uh, metabolism, this is you eating too. That's, that explains the, the you know, uh, like whatever, jazz cabbage, or whatever all of these, these, these coinages are, munchies, that explains the munchies. Leptin, that's a satiety hormone. How does leptin work? Well, it inhibits AMPK. And so when you look at insulin and leptin in the hypothalamus, we have PI3K and PKB, we have MAPK over here, and we're inhibiting AMPK. Now, AMPK in, in the hypothalamus and the periphery, over here is in the periphery, over here is in the hypothalamus, 
so you hypothalamus right here, periphery over here. Leptin in the hypothalamus is inhibiting AMPK. That's a satiety hormone. You can stop eating now. Cannabinoids, right? Your, your marijuana, the, your munchies, um, that's promoting it. Low glucose promoting it. Ghrelin, the opposite of leptin, promoting it. So you, you're going to go eat. Remember the hypothalamus, one of those Fs is going to be dining. And leptin is inhibiting it. Now in the periphery stuff can have different effects. And you know, we've talked about IL-6. I, I didn't put, I'm not putting in any of the slides, but let's promote AMPK. But IL-6 has hypertrophic responses and atrophy responses. IL-6 is weird. That's why I don't really talk about it. Um, adiponectin, this is the thing I talk about. Fast cells release adiponectin. It's the thing I mentioned about how if, you, if you're eating a bunch of your, all your vitamin C pills and stuff around workouts, you're, you are limiting the release of adiponectin. And, and some of that effect on insulin sensitivity is, is, is uh, the effect of adiponectin. And so you should work out and then not eat a ton of carbs and you not eat a bunch of, uh, you know, I mean, you, should, you should try to enhance the, the, the response of, of insulin sensitivity if, if you, know, you have diabetes or you're looking at weight loss or something like that. Now, um, look at leptin. Leptin in the hypothalamus inhibiting AMPK. And it makes sense because you're inhibiting your appetite. Leptin, satiety hormone. What's leptin released from? Fat cells. When is it released? When fat cells are growing. You've just eaten a ton of food. Fat cells are growing, they release leptin. And now that's one of the triggers of, of puberty. And, and, and once fat cells are, are sort of out of their hyperplasia years and they start growing, that's why people are hitting puberty at younger and younger and younger ages, is, is fat cells are growing at younger and younger and younger ages, owing to things like um, availability of of maybe uh, package the sort of the hostess life and the wonder bread life and the easy access of, of countless carbohydrates in a, in a, you know, bread bag. And, and, um, and then the, a, a lack of physical activity, we're, we're seeing this, this leptin being released earlier in life. That's not what we're talking about here, but we're inhibiting it in the hypothalamus because your fast cells are growing. You don't need to keep eating. You're growing now. Now, Leptin in the periphery, it's turning on AMPK. It's, it's, it's activating AMPK in the periphery. It's inhibiting in the hypothalamus. It seems counterintuitive, but if you think about it, your, your fat cells are growing. You don't need, you can stop eating. Go ahead and stop eating. That's fine. But why don't we start burning some of this stuff? Let, let's, let's uh, mobilize some, let, let's, let's get some, some energy substrates into the cell and consume them. Um, and so that's why leptin is increasing AMPK signaling in, in the periphery. So let's get into the summaries. A few minutes left. I don't know, five minutes left of, of this lecture. So I, I don't know how much time is left in class, but I'll go for another five minutes or so. Um, so AMPK is turned on by ATP hydrolysis, followed by adenylic kinase, followed by the accumulation of AMP, followed by its activation by some upstream kinase. LKB1 is the one I care about. You know, I don't, who cares about like calcium sensing and in, in, in the intracellular calcium sensing. LKB1, uh, we are activating the, the, or phosphorylating the alpha site. Um, and then the gamma site, that's where, that's where the subunit, the gamma subunit, that's where AMP is binding. The beta, that's where your glycogen is binding. AMPK turns off, mTOR turns off recovery, regeneration, repair, it turns off all of that stuff by phosphorylating raptor that inhibits it, phosphorylating tuberin, which promotes it, and probably some direct mTOR interaction, but these are the two that I care about. Remember, protein translation, that can be half of the cell's metabolic expense. That's why it's turning it off. It's super expensive and it's trying to conserve. Now, uh, it turns on atrophy in part by turning on tuberin, turning off Raptor. Raptor is recruiting its downstream targets, and that's translation down here. This is my little hand-drawn diagram. But then over here, we see this old one in FOXO and the, the lysosomal uh, system of, of autophagy protein degradation and the ubiquitin proteasome system. So we are promoting protein degradation over here with its phosphorylations. And just the general summary, I, at the beginning of this lecture, I think I said we're going to sort of start and end with the same stuff. Where we ended last lecture, let's, let's have this be the parentheses of today's lecture. So mTOR is turned on by, as you should have, you should be bored by this by now, you should know, need. 
mTOR is turned on by need. So if you subject tissues to loads, which cause structural damage, those loads causing structural damage, the degree of damage corresponds to the magnitude of the load that damage releases chemicals, you know, the interleukins and interferons and prostaglandins, all that stuff. More damage, more chemicals, right? The, the more banged up your, your phospholipid bilayer gets, the more prostaglandins you're going to have, the more arachidonic acid you release, the more prostaglandins you develop. So more damage, more chemicals. Those chemicals notify the cellular machinery that repair is needed, repair is in order. The mechanical load itself, independent of all of those chemicals, the, the mechanical load itself informs the cell of what the current stress is, and the inflammation informs it of what the recent stress was, the stress that has just passed. So here's what you need to fix now, chemicals, and here's an estimation of what's coming. Um, uh, mechanical. I don't have any resources to offer you. This is just about need. I'm letting you know how to prioritize. So need activates mTOR. Nutrition also activates mTOR. So all fauna, you included, me included, we fast and we feed, and our bodies need a way of detecting which state we're in. Are we fasting or are we feeding? So it can respond appropriately. Remember, metabolic metabolism that's what that's what this is is it's 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 metabolic um uh fitness it's it's we are trying to be optimally calibrated to our environment and so it would be dangerous at least wasteful if not outright dangerous to behave in any other way other than fitness and thirdly the assumption of nutrition so let's do a story time for this one. Consider the life choices of an unemployed person named Jake the hog catcher Matterham Jr. If Jake THCM Jr. is responsible, he's going to spend his money sparingly, right? He's unemployed. He's going to spend his money sparingly. There's nothing coming in. He doesn't know how long his savings will need to last when he's going to get a job. Who knows? But if he's informed of a big windfall that's headed his way, this big influx inheritance that's headed his way, the reluctance to spend his savings loosens its grip. The same thing happens when your cells anticipate the arrival of caloric income. An injection of insulin is going to notify your cells that they've just won the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes, right? The money isn't here yet, but it's coming in the mail. It's just been sent. Go ahead and translate that new car. Go ahead and translate proteins. Go ahead and spend the last of your savings because new funds are going to arrive shortly. So need nutrition, assumption of nutrition. That's what's turning on mTOR. You know what mTOR looks like. We have the, the MLSD8 or GABL, G protein beta subunit like GABL. The mTOR itself, there's FKBP12. That's where rapamycin interacts. There's raptor. Raptor is where, how the rags are moving. It's a recruiter of downstream targets. So you know um, how this stuff works. Press 40 and Deptor regulatory, negative uh, regulators of, of mTOR. Uh, you know what tuberin is, TSC2, REB-GTP, REB-GDP, right? Tuberin, the tuberous sclerosis complex. These two are traveling together, just like mTOR is a complex. Um, and, and earlier, a couple of lectures ago, I said these complexes are, are like families of proteins. Um, let's say mTOR complex one is, is the maternal figure, uh, or the, the mTOR enzyme itself is, is mom, um, sort of running the household, and, and uh, maybe MLST8 is, is whatever, dad. And, and raptor is the kid, and, and we have some goldfish and dogs and stuff, or, you know, depter. And, so we complexes. Nobody's going to say dad and dog are the same person, and, unless the wife, you're such a dog, right, with, with cliches aside. Um, but what we have here is tuberin 
converting GTP into GDP, right? So REB GTP is going to be what activates mTOR downstream from complex one. Now complex two, uh, PKB, AKT or PKB is promoting that. So, so complex two is up here, but A and PK we're shutting off or uh, I'm sorry, we're turning on uh, tuberin. A and PK we're shutting off mTOR via the um, activation of tuberin and through uh, Raptor, which isn't in this diagram. Uh, PKB, we are inhibiting tuberin so that Reb can, can actively turn on mTOR complex one downstream from complex one for EBP1 and P70S6K. Downstream from that, ribosomal protein S6, protein synthesis. We are growing. You know what complex two is. Richter, the rapamycin insensitive RI. Richter, the companion of TOR. Um, it's downstream targets. Among them is PKB. Uh, linking complex two to complex one. PKB is downstream from complex uh, two and it is inhibiting uh, tuberin so that Reb can activate mTOR complex one. And you know all these things, right? A bunch of activators, a bunch of, a bunch of interactions. Now we're going to get into drugs and supplements soon. Next up, our next topic is going to be applications of mTOR. So the mechanical, you know, mechanotransduction, we're looking at cadherins, titan, integrin, don't consider that a complete list. There's probably some other things involved, but intracellular um, titan, right? Intercellular cadherins, extracellular, so extracellular matrix, transmembrane protein to the inside, integrins, and these different chemicals and hormones and the nutrition and, and methyl xanthines, right? Caffeine is one, theobromine, that's like you eat up your chocolate and you'll get both of them, uh, theophylline. So the, all these things are, are methyl xanthines, you know how those work, inhibitors of phosphodiesterase. So when we're looking at some of these different drugs and supplements in the signaling cascade, uh, we'll get to that after we do the interactions, applications, you know, application-y considerations. All right, we're done. What questions do we have? Can you go over uh, uh, AMP deaminase again really fast? AMP deaminase, yeah, is going to convert AMP. This is your system of disposal. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you know, ATP hydrolysis, adenylate kinase, AMP deaminase. AMP deaminase, de-amine, deaminate um, your AMP, adenosine monophosphate. So it converts this to IMP and ammonia. And that'll become important later when we talk about ammonia and you can protonate it and um, get your NH4. But that's at the end of the semester when, when I'm not holding anybody accountable for, for the accountability part. You're trying to dispose of your AMP. So you have an ATP AMP ratio that permits ongoing performance. The worse that ratio gets, it's not just AMPK. It's also things like oh, calcium release um, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You're going you're gonna, to you're release your calcium, and, and ATP AMP ratio affects that. Uh, ATP AMP. Right? I mean, they, so th these these ratios have all, or like ATP ADP. So th think about cross bridge cycling, and and you know you're going to have to release this ADP, and you start building up all this ADP, and um, and so there are there are physiological phenomena where ATP AMP ratio is really important, and the enzyme that disposes of AMP is that AMP deaminase to IMP, inosine monophosphate and ammonia. And what I said about metformin is a lot of these drugs have a ton of effects in the body. You know, a pharmacologist has to look at a lot of things, but it is an inhibitor. One of its main effects is it's an inhibitor of AMP deaminase. And so it allows your AMP to accumulate. If you block Remember, we, we talked about the different forms of enzyme inhibition, and most of these drugs are just inhibiting enzymes. Um, so if you inhibit AMP deaminase, AMP builds up. When AMP builds up, it binds to um, 
AMPK and to the gamma subunit of AMPK. And a couple of them bind, and that permits activation by LKB1. And now you have all of this glucose regulation and uh, atrophy happening at the same time. So AMP deaminase in the presence with ATP uh, would keep mTOR on. So we are getting rid of, we're improving the ratio constantly? Yes. Yeah, so if you're improving that ratio, the ratio of ATP to AMP, that's really what matters. Not necessarily the total amount of something you have, but the proportions that you have. And in most things in life, proportions are so important. I mean, look at like injury susceptibility. When we were talking about biomechanics and, and overuse injuries, one muscle group might not be absolutely weak in some athletes, right? It might actually be stronger than other people, but relative to the opposing force, it's weak. And so you, you sort of accept an amount of risk with these relative strength ratios of the opposition of forces. And, and so these, these ratios matter for a lot of things in life and physiologically they matter too uh, with the, the sort of opposition of ATP and AMP in a lot of areas, but but for atrophy and hypertrophy, that balance, it does matter too. And so yeah, AMP, AMP deaminase, you're, you're correcting a ratio as you build up a bunch of AMP, you dispose of that AMP to try to preserve a ratio, which allows you to exercise longer to, to, to perform for longer. All of these things are in the interest of, of self-preservation, you know, survival, self-preservation, and, and ongoing performance must be important because you, you, you're you adamantly running. You just, you're not stopping all of your running, so I, I better do something to keep you performing. AMP deaminase, now it serves a lot of roles in the body, but um, yeah, just think in terms of this particular topic, fitness. It's, it's, it's a metabolic fitness of, of managing ATP AMP ratio. Now, can we get that to be stuck on? So having, uh, instead of uh, having a buildup of AMP, keeping uh, a surplus of uh, AMP deaminase, just a high level of that enzyme, just going to uh, keep that ratio in the golden for hypertrophy, for maximal hypertrophy? I like your question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think 80% of your questions, the best I can do is a shrug. And then I can follow up with some, you know, well, maybe if I, I so some sort of cloudy creativity. So yeah, there's probably something there. And I, there would be reason to worry from a pharmacological perspective of what else are you messing up. But, but I think there's probably something there. I just, you know, I, I applaud your creativity and I shrug, I shrug as I applaud. <laughs> and that's, that's the best I can do. Well, then we, we can also do the opposite uh, is can we just skyrocket ATP just like to just offset the ratio? So is there a limit to the amount? Of, I know we're talking about ratios, but the amount of ATP present, is there a way or is there always going to be a ceiling that like this tissue, this cell is just not going to allow any more ATP, free ATP? Yeah, I, I don't know what the max ceiling is because it, it varies from person to person. So it's possible, uh, you know, if you're if you're still on the call and and you're like, let's just, okay, you, Patrick, I don't know, you have over 100 grams of, of ATP on board, but I don't, I don't know, probably, you know, whereas your grandma, I don't know, she has 50 grams on board. So it, it varies the total amount of ATP you have on just like, uh, phosphocreatine, the total amount you have on board varies from person to person. Are you a, you know, a muscular athlete with, with a history of training? The, the amounts are going to vary. And, and can you supplement or drug yourself or, or do some intervention that's going to mimic a history of athleticism with its effect on ATP? I bet there's I bet there's stuff that you could do. I don't know it. I, I, I all, all this is is me like rubbing your shoulders and go, good question. That that's that's what, that's what, like all I'm able to do with these. Uh, it, so yeah, I, I think those are great ideas and you know potential areas of exploration if they have not yet been explored. Maybe they have, right? Maybe that's not the final frontier. Maybe that's like a frontier we already passed, and I'm just totally unfamiliar with the work in that field. But 
really, really good questions. I have more. I yeah, guess. no, keep going. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I might not have any more answers, but but yeah, keep it coming. Uh, you said a leptin primarily, uh, an increase in leptin prepubescent increases uh, or uh, expedites the age of puberty. Uh, so does that mean that if we see a youth that does intense amounts of cardiovascular uh, exercise for long periods of time, so say they're cross country from pre-puberty, they'll enter puberty at a much later date than their peers? Yeah, and you've seen it. You've seen it. Watch the Olympics. Watch those gymnasts, the super lean female gymnasts um, or the male. I mean, just everyone looks like little kids. And, you know, there's like a 19 year old gymnast who's never had her period. And now, now it's not just leptin. There's there's more to it than that. Leptin is part of a of a sort of constellation of, of triggers. And it's a big part. But you're you're in your like little baby years and you're drinking your you know mountain dews and stuff and you're getting an increase in the total number of fat cells this hyperplasia of, of fat cells there comes a point where adults it does vary you know when people think oh, you have the same number of fat cells on the day you die as you did when you were 20 like, oh, and that's not true but but you do you do sort of level off and and it becomes this jagged mountain range of how many you have trail somebody through life so, but it is steady-ish the numbers are 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 something close to steady and in the hyperplasia years if you overdo the calories you can induce fat cell growth before they sort of stop duplicating when that happens, when they go, so for once they stabilize, now they're just growing and shrinking and growing and shrinking, sort of accordioning themselves. And in that growth, when fat cells expand, they release leptin. And you today go eat and whatever. And, and like if your fat cells expand a little bit, they're, they're going to release leptin. And that's one of your, your uh, managers of, of appetite. And you can tell because people who have no leptin there's like mouse knockout studies and you look like the mouse with no leptin and the mouse with normal leptin and the mouse with no leptin, it just can't stop eating. I mean, it's like enormous. It's like a person, it's like a person sized mouse. And like you can't even walk. It's like, it's, it's like, it's paws like come out of it. Like this little tiny paw, his legs look like T-Rex arms. Uh, but in people too, that you you can look at um, leptin deficient people and and their just their appetite doesn't 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 go away, but yeah, it is it is one of the triggers of of puberty. And so as as your fat cells expand in a young age, that's one of the the triggers. So if you if you see somebody who's super lean, your observation is is right that they that that person has never had a period. Or they're like a guy and whatever the equivalent. Now, uh, if leptin is produced by adipose tissue during times of high feeding, why isn't somebody that is like morbidly obese have like an insane amount of leptin and just lose all appetite and then lose adiposity? Isn't it supposed to be a counterbalance or uh, is there a leptin sensitivity that's pushed back? Okay. Um, so that's, I think, your, your latter point. No, I'm not an expert there. And so there's research that I haven't read that's going to answer that question much more effectively than this, but um, there seems to be leptin sensitivity uh, issues that, that, that can, that can arise just like sensitivity with everything, insulin and everything else. So I think to my understanding, you're correct. Um, there, there is likely more to it. Uh, but the extent that I know is the sensitivity explanation. I'd be afraid of uh, something like uh... Uh, a, truly a desensitized cell. So um, obesity is a self-perpetuating fact because they would have to eat more to get to this, to a higher level of leptin in order for them, for their satiety. And then it becomes more desensitized. So they have to eat more to produce more leptin. And so it just, and it just perpetuates the overweight. It's sort of, it, it's an interesting phenomenon. I mean, because you see that in drinking, you know, as I have to, the first shot of whatever of rum or something people ever have i mean they're just wasted <laughs> like one shot and you know of course they're like six years old but 
<laughs> the, so, but the, the first shot, and they have this triumphant buzz and they just are like, their voice gets way too loud and, and everybody look at me and they like jump off of some like roof or something and sprain their, sprain their ankle and don't feel it. And, and the, the invincibility. Fit. And then like the next weekend, it takes two shots and then it takes three and people keep drinking and drinking and drinking. And then now it's just like, you can never get back to that like triumphant buzz and it's just constant. Like how many bottles of this do I have to go through? And, or look like insulin. I mean, uh, endocrinologists will give insulin prescriptions to patients who have type two diabetes. It's like, well, I'll just give you even more. It's your, it'll work, you know, it's, but, but it's acute versus chronic. Uh, we often sacrifice the long run for the short sprint. And whether it's giving a, a type two, a patient with type two diabetes insulin or um, giving an athlete a bunch of ibuprofen, let's get you back on the field. Well, that's mean, you asshole. Why, why, why would you do that to me? <laughs> like this, you, you, you don't care about my future. You are spending my future now, right? You're, 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 you're cashing in my sort of future investment and trying to spend that money now and you're not going to get as much out of it. So I think we do that in life behaviorally and I think our, our bodies may do it a little bit too. I just want to be a great puppet master with my, my cellular biology, just like fine tinker everything I'm ever doing. So. That's exactly what I do this for. You know, it's, it's I mean, clearly, uh, I mean, I, I think people in this class are probably more engaged than historically, uh, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. Just because it's like quarantine, what else the hell We're do you have lonely. to do? It's just like it's, everyone's <laughs> bored. And so maybe people are more engaged. But that's the whole point of, of doing this is to say, here are the ingredients. Your kitchen is loaded. And here's the cookbook. Here, here's how to cook up whatever dish you want. Do, for human performance, whatever... <sighs> whatever you want to accomplish for your physique, for your verbs, right? You're all of your activities and, and I, want do, I want to do infinity pull-ups or sprint or high jump or run 20 marathons or whatever. Um, here's all the ingredients to cook that dish up. And then the, the puppet mastering, right? The, the tinkering. Um, that's what it's for is to give you every single ingredient to do so. And so that's what I hope, that's what I hope people are doing. But also when people move into the next phase of life, because you're not a student for all that long, you're a student for four years, a couple of years of grad school, whatever, you're going to be in your profession for like ever. I mean, you're going to be this, this like frustrated tax paying, like boring adults for a really long time relative to how many years you have in school. And you should be good at it, whatever you choose to do. And so if you're going into a health field, a clinical field, especially physical therapy, um, if you go into physical therapy and you don't know this, it's negligence, right? People are paying you money. And if you know how the body works, how physical therapy works, how mechanotransduction is physical therapy, is just mechanotransduction, the entire field is just... It's just using mechanotransduction. I mean, that's really physical therapy is, is like, you should be, come up with some sort of acronym for what that means. Like the, the appropriate employment of mechanotransduction in wounded like, or, or, or otherwise limited populations or something like that. That's all physical therapy is. And so if you don't know the science of it, um, it's harmful to the patients. People are coming to you paying a lot of money and they could be getting a service and it, and like you're an asshole if you don't give it to them, right? You're just cashing checks and giving them made up shit. I mean, that's that's what, honestly, what most physical therapists do. There are some really good ones out there. There's some really good physical therapists, but most of them are just cashing checks and giving you like bullshit answers. That's, those are bad people, right? I mean, this isn't a sociology class, but let's talk ethics for a second. Like give them what they're paying for. Someone comes to you, they expect you to be uh, uh, an expert in the field. You better know shit. And so we call those uh, personal trainers. There's all the, it is, about, and, and Peg Chicolella did her, her, we went through on, was it day one, day two, mm -hmm. something like that. We went through Peg Chicolella's uh, paper on this subject. 
and the Ross die case, the person was trying, like, he like, killed the guy. I mean, yeah. yeah, he survived, but he had a heart attack and he killed the guy. And he's like, well, trainers don't have to know anything. There is no, there is no um, standard of care. Right. With, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, working, working in a gym, uh, you meeting so many trainers, you can see a level of complacency in their, in their repertoire of knowledge and their hunger to keep learning and it's just every day it's just like like oh my god you are going to kill people and it's just it's wild <laughs> that's that's what i hope and um let me take a screenshot hold on just a second um that's what i hope people get out of this now not everybody and it's okay it's totally okay that if you're if you if it's like you know tomorrow or later tonight or something or five years from now or something and and somebody's listening to this totally fine if you're not interested in the material I took tons of college classes that I was like I, I hate this I just have to get my grade I have to get out of here I it's it's a hurdle it's an it's a it's a little obstacle along the course to graduation I mean as you have found out education is a series of obstacles. And what you have to do is figure out how to clear. Have you guys ever seen that? It was like a TED talk about the, like the Mario effect. Have you guys ever watched that one? About how education is just a whole series of obstacles. Here's the ladder, here's the lake, here's the uh, crocodile or something. And you have to figure out how to Mario yourself over the pits. And That's sort of what, what education is like. And sometimes people have no interest in muscle physiology and that's totally fine. Right? I'm, this is what I do, so I'm biased and I like it and I enjoy teaching it and, and I enjoy having these conversations after class where we, we, we talk about this you know, exact stuff. Uh, I'm less interested in, I have no interest in pulmonary physiology because I, I can't, I don't know how to change it. It just doesn't adapt. It's, it's just so unadaptable. And so I never really, I'm bad at it. it like, yeah, I could go through and like all the vol, all like the title volumes and, and whatever. Fine. I, I, I but I don't know anything about the physiology of you know, pulmonary. I'm pretty bad at cardiovascular physiology. I just wasn't as interested in it. Like the heart is a muscle too. And I, I like biceps better. Like they're all a bunch of muscles and I, I, I prefer the triceps and <laughs> than the heart. But so I'm not, I'm not like an expert in, in these things. And so I, it, when I take those classes, I'm fascinated, but not so fascinated that I, that I you know, would stick around too much and pay attention. And, and so it's just whatever people want to get out of this class, but if you're going into clinical care and you don't know it, we have, we have like ethical conversations to have. Uh, that's not how the world works. Um, why not just like rob convenience stores? If, if, if that's how you wanna make money is stealing by, by giving people made up information, just go rob banks. There's more dignity. Um, Cause then you're being honest about what it is you're doing for a profession. If you don't know what you're doing, and you're collecting people's money and lying to them, like just seriously, please go hold up a convenience store because there's so much more honesty and dignity in that in that um, experience. Um, to, to not learn mechanotransduction is to be a negligent clinician. And again, there's a ton of them, but there's also a ton of really good, Alfredson, I'm almost positive, was a physical therapist. The Alfredson protocol. I mean, that was a smart guy. I'm almost positive he's a physical therapist. You, you look it up, but um, but there's a ton of physical therapists who are just there. These are like serious, you know, biomechanists and and physiologists, and they understand their stuff. And you go to them, and suddenly you have like a different person's body. Like you look in the mirror, and like, whoa, I just inherited a new body. <laughs> um, and so there's it's 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 one of the best fields. I think physical therapy, one of the most noble, useful. Uh, effective fields there are in the world. Enormous respect for physical therapy, but you got to do it right. <laughs> you know, and so, and this is the foundation of that. Of, of here's Patrick, what you, what you were saying about about the puppets. A patient comes to you. Every patient's a puppet. What do you do with them? Uh, I mean, you, you better move their little limbs and stuff, and sort of ventriloquize them into into health. Otherwise, you just cash and checks. I'm like you're a prick <laughs> at that point if, if if you don't if you don't puppet them right um, if you don't do your puppeteering rant over uh, what all right what else so um, I did ask a question earlier uh, in the chat and I don't know if I got the answer that I was I was uh, hoping for but it was is there a uh, should I pre-signal mTOR by taking insulin or 
sugar, carbohydrates, or uh, before the workout, or should I wait till after the workout, after the mechanical stress has been done, then to signal uh, mTOR via insulin? Would either of those uh, be more beneficial than the other? Yeah. Okay. So if you take a bunch of carbs and then you go start a bunch of exercise, you're not really going to get an insulin response. I mean, you're just going to get like an AMPK, um, you have non glucose insulin or uh, 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 glucose uptake. Um, non insulin glucose, whatever the hell I just said, non insulin glucose uptake. Uh, and so this is just a bunch of like AMPK mobilizing your, your sugar for you and, and sort of the mechanical part of it. So you won't get that anabolic response from the carbs necessarily, not, not from insulin PI3K signaling. That said, I have seen studies that show the amount of protein translation that you can get if you take the protein before or after a workout. Taking it before, people got more protein translation. It was, you know, I think they're just doing branch chains, but like leucine is the important one. So, so you know, when do you take your leucine? And I'll, I'll go over that study. I'll, 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 if it's not in slides, I'll, I'll put it in the slides of, of before the, it elicited a larger protein translation response from the workout. But I don't think it's that big of a deal and it sort of depends on how you're testing and when you're testing and and at the end of a week is anything different i haven't seen data that that you know say either way on that but in in this very short term what i've seen is before is better than after don't don't take that as as gospel though I'm in a Chickalella's 110 class, which is her law class. And oh, okay. I just, she, when you brought up the Ross Dye case, she gets fired up whenever she talks about that. I bet, I bet she does. It's a great study. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating case of, of what is the standard of care? You know, I mean, it's, it's like, wh why do personal trainers just get to sort of, have lethal exercise prescriptions and and and, and sort of with impunity i mean the guy he's, he's, it was practically that was practically manslaughter and it was like attempted manslaughter if that can be a thing and it's just no it's fine you're a personal trainer i had no physiological kinesiology background and I went in and applied for a job and they put me in as a personal trainer and they're like as long as you get your cert in the next 30 days and so they trained me there on the spot and day one they had me doing exercises with people I had no idea and I was just like this is like I was like okay I was really excited to be there and then as the years progressed I was like this is dangerous this whole model all of this is bad and I, I became an advocate I was like it needs to be two years at least it can't be a cert. It has to be a licensure. Like you can't do this anymore. It's so dangerous. I'm uh, if if there's a possibility of being more than 100 percent with you, that is my agreement. Yeah. Yeah, because these kids get just a cert that took them, you know, 10 hours of studying, binge studying the practice exam, and then they just take the exam, they pass it, and they just retake that exam every two years, and they've never progressed. They've never learned. And it was, it's, it was dangerous. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And all, I mean, all the questions are just like, what is, what muscle is being worked when you're doing the negative on a calf raise? I mean, or whatever. It's just like, uh, the, like well, that's uh, not, that's not really all that helpful for, you know, yeah. not killing people. The, so like they had muscles that were like typoed and it was just like, I was sitting there and I'm like, that's not the name of that muscle. It was just, it was all bad. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's the industry. And as you say, you know, as long as it's a certification, it's just sort of a scam. Uh, and I mean, there are, there's a few good certifications. I mean, we talked about ACSMs, um, the um, NSCA, uh, the, some of the, whatever, the CSCS, right, is the NSCA one. And I don't know, ACE has been around for a really long time and it's a nonprofit organization that's been around forever. But there's just a really, there aren't that many good ones. I mean, it's fine, be a personal trainer, go get a certification. I did it when I was an undergrad and and for a while after undergrad and, and you make a bunch of money, but but it's, it's a corrupt system <laughs> though. So 
All right, let's get out of here. Uh, on that note, on the note of corruption, let's go, go enjoy your weekend. Thank you.